It really is a delight to introduce Catherine Simpson. She's a good friend. I work with Catherine a little bit. I'm, I've been doing a little bit of work with the Diocese of Durham for the last few years. And uh, Catherine is a firm favorite in the diocese. Look at that smile. I knew she'd smile at that one. Um, and uh, so Catherine's been working as part of the team there, particularly leading on their Growing Faith initiative and been doing a fantastic job. And she's been a, a primary school chaplain for many years too. Um, we actually pre-recorded Catherine's seminar after the demise of uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> we decided as a failsafe we would record all of our seminars. And because Catherine did such a spectacularly brilliant job uh, of recording her seminar, we're going to play it. We're just going to play the recording of Catherine doing her session, which lasts about 20 minutes. And while that's going on, as Rob said, please... Uh, add your sort of questions and comments uh, into the chat directed at um, Rob and I. And then after that, we'll, do a we'll have a little bit of breakout time and then we'll pose some questions to Catherine seeing as she's here with us. We're not gonna let her get away lightly. We'll pose our most awkward, uh, not our awkward questions. We'll be kind, um, ask our best questions of you, Catherine. Uh, and I think this is a really important subject because there's quite a lot of secondary school chaplains, but there are very few primary school chaplains. And so what you are doing is, is pioneering um, in many ways. So I think there'll be lots of questions for you. I think that's about it. Um, so we're gonna make sure everyone's muted. I think that's about it, isn't it? Shall we, shall we crack on, Rob? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's good to be with you um, at long last. Um, just a little bit about myself before I start. Um, so I'm Catherine Simpson. I live in Bishop Auckland in County Durham. It's a little market town. Uh, I'm married to Mike, who's a teacher. So it's good that we have one person in the house who knows absolutely everything. I've got two children, uh, Jacob, who's 15, and my daughter, Hope, who is 19 um, and that's a whole other story I could talk all day about Hope and what she teaches me. So my seminar is all about primary school chaplaincy um, and I thought I'd try and think of a, a clever title but the best I could do with was part of the furniture and if you look up the definition of part of the furniture it says something like this a person or thing that has been somewhere so long as they seem to be a permanent, unquestioned or invisible feature of the landscape. Hard to imagine the place without them. And I believe this is ultimately the opportunity of chaplaincy. Now, my story with chaplaincy starts seven years ago and I was not seen as part of the furniture, let me assure you, when I first started. Um, it was the then vision of the new head teacher. Um, she employed two sort of new posts. One was a director of sport, which was very grand for a small primary school. And the second was the role of a school chaplain. When I began in post to say that I was greeted with some scepticism is a bit of an understatement. Um, and that was from uh, particularly from staff and from parents. Um, I had comments from staff like, oh, well, we're not that sort of a school and we're a nice school. We don't need somebody like you. To parents who were like, eh, we've gone all religious. I didn't know we were Catholic. There was a long way to go. There was a long way to go. Prior to my role in St Anne's Primary School, I worked um, in a large Catholic comprehensive school. Uh, heading up their student welfare team. I used to say that I um, I worked with the mad, the bad and the sad, which turned out to be really uh, good sort of training ground for working with clergy. Anyway, that's kind of a little bit about me. Um, and I just want to tell you my story, really, of how I've become part of the furniture at St Anne's and how the fact that that has taken time, time to build up, trust, friendships, relationships, rapport, time to earn the right, really, to, to be a part of their story. 
I'm going to talk a lot about different stories um, and I feel like I should possibly stand up and confess at this point that uh, my name's Catherine Simpson and I'm addicted to children's stories because especially in lockdown I went a bit crazy with my shopping and uh, I bought loads and loads of kids story books. Um, I would like to point out at this point in time my Zoom bookshelves behind me. Um, my other claim to fame is I recently came second in a Zoom competition for the best bookshelves. Um, I came second to the Bishop of Durham, so I'd, I'd hardly see that as being fair. Um, if you look carefully, there are one or two theology books, but most of them are children's stories. Simple stories with profound messages. One of my favourites is up there, Sean Tan, The Red Tree. Um, I feel like I should be on commission because I, I must have bought and recommended that, that book to so many people. Um, it's absolutely amazing. But Jesus, of course, was the master storyteller. That was how he got people's attention. He used to take things that people could relate to and then he would draw them in and share something amazing, something big and profound with them. There's a Native American proverb that says this, tell me the facts and I'll learn, tell me the truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. We are hardwired for connection and stories can be part of, of that connection. They can take us to all kinds of places. I think that's probably why I'm so passionate about education and why I've worked in education for so long, not as a teacher. Reading especially opens up so many worlds and there's a power and a vulnerability in sharing our own stories. And of course, as Christians, we have a powerful story to tell. It's not a story of plain sailing and everything being OK and everything going right. But it's a powerful story of, of hope. Go to my next page. I'm just going to ask you to pray um, with me now just for a moment. Dear Father, your light does not lose its power like a device that loses its battery and turns itself off. Your light shines to the world. Your light doesn't just shine for one person, it shines for everyone. Your light is a symbol of your love, God. It is a reminder for us to always do our best. We are all part of God's family. We love you, God, and we are proud of that. Amen. That prayer was written by a little girl in my school, uh, Emily, when she was seven. She doesn't go to church. She doesn't really have any sort of background. Um, but she wrote that amazing prayer. And this is the privilege of my job in that children come to me all the time with written prayers or ideas or things they've made. And my first thing is to say, don't underestimate uh, the contribution of children, including the children outside of our churches. Rebecca Nye's book is, is brilliant about children's spirituality. And she says this, God has a special way of being with children and children have special ways of being with God. And this has been my experience as a school chaplain. I think initially I kind of went in thinking I was going to do everything and I was going to lead the children. Um, thankfully, uh, a lot of the time, they're the ones leading me. God is at work in our schools and he's at work in our children. So don't miss it. Don't be so caught up in what you want to do and what you think you should be doing that you miss something that is already happening. So join in and don't miss those opportunities. I understand obviously people listening today will be in different contexts and some of you will be in Church of England schools, some of you will be in community schools. But just for a second, I just want to uh, look at the education that the Church of England has for their schools. Within the concept of a full and flourishing life, the Church of England seeks to provide all young people the opportunity to have a life-enhancing encounter with the Christian faith and the person of Jesus Christ. Wow. That sounds uh, pretty exciting to me. Church schools should, above all else, be places where relationships prosper and nurtured are encouraged to mature with wisdom, are cherished when under threat or are broken, relationships between the whole community are important and of course one of the latest initiatives with the Church of England is the Growing Faith adventure 
which seeks to examine how churches and schools and families can work more together on growing faith. I would encourage you, if you are in a Church of England school, or if that's where you're looking to, to get into, that you have a look um, at the wealth of documents that is on their website. Um, I had the privilege of attending the, uh, the the Church of England National Conference earlier this year, and it was incredible. It was one of the most inspiring, uplifting things that I've been to in a long time. And I think understanding that context is really important. Why is the church involved in education? Why why have we got a part to play? SIAMs, I could talk forever on SIAMs. There are so many exciting opportunities. Again, if you're not familiar with the new schedule and you're going into a church school, look at the new SIAM schedule. There is a wealth of opportunities for you to support your schools in that. I do get it. I need to get out more, don't I? Right. Obviously, you're not all in Church of England schools or you're not all trying to get into Church of England schools, but you'd probably be familiar with uh, something called SMSC, which is the Spiritual, Moral, Social and Cultural Development of our children in schools. And this is something that Ofsted uh, will judge all schools on. And again, looking at the language, looking at what's expected, there are, are just so many opportunities for us to to go in from churches and organisations to say, how can we support your SMSC programme? And it's, it's, I guess it's learning to talk in the language of school a little bit. You know, we, we have our own language in church, don't we, that people can't make head and a tail of half the time. And school's a little bit the same. It's almost like it's, a, it's another world in itself. But if you can capture that and if you can get into the language and start to, to talk in ways that the school can relate to you, then you'll end up, ticking boxes for both of you for want of a better way of putting it. Um, and there are some brilliant boxes that we can be ticking. A huge part of my job as chaplain is to manage um, pupil voice groups. So I've got about eight different pupil voice groups. Uh, we've got a, a road safety team, we've got an anti-bullying team, we've got a chaplaincy team, a collective worship group. Um, I think this is where the church is still catching up uh, children in school have many, many opportunities for leadership and growth. Um, and I think we need to expect more of them in church, give them more opportunities. But again, is this is this an area that you could go to your primary school and say, how can I help with pupil voice? Uh, we know that it's something that you'd be judged on with your SMSC or your PSHG. How can we support you? But chaplaincy isn't just about church schools. There are many, many ways of articulating a vision for chaplaincy. And there's, there's loads of different models. You know, every context is unique. Every community is unique. Chaplaincy can be described as distinctly Christian and utterly inclusive. Even obviously as in a Church of England school, I am there for the children of all faiths and the children of none. And that needs to be made very clear. It's the spiritual and pastoral care of all. The chaplain is there to listen and care, to pray and bless the school. The Church of England has described uh, chaplaincy as the public face of God. You now, some of our children or many of our children and our families don't have any connection with church. School will be their only connection with that spiritual uh, encounter, if you like. It's a massive, massive opportunity. So chaplaincy in education um, schools are at the heart of the church's mission, but not arenas for evangelism. Chaplaincy is there to listen, to care, to pray and to bless. Again, it could be talking uh, in terms that schools can understand. So at the moment, obviously, there's a huge focus and emphasis on emotional and mental health. Um, surely, as, as people of faith, you know, with the greatest message of hope, we have a contribution to make, the hope that comes from our faith, the support that comes from our church communities. So again, it could be looking at things in a slightly different way. And instead of saying, can I come in and do an assembly? It might be, how can I support your emotional wellbeing program? How can I support your vulnerable families? For me, I guess, different in a church school, again, it can be much more overt, but, um, I, I, my days can be full of all kinds of different things from supporting a family to access the food bank to getting gas and electric stamps to 
looking at bereavement support to signposting for debt management to parents, them coming in and having a chat using the phone, domestic violence signposting, all kinds of all kinds of stuff. I often think somebody once said to me, oh, name a sermon that kind of has, has changed you or that you would go to for help. And some of you might be kind of like, oh, yes, I would give you this verse or I'd give you that verse. Well, nine times out of ten, it's a person that comes to mind. And I want to be that person in my school community. Whether those people have faith or not, I want them to be like, right, who, who can help me with this? It's the chaplain. It's that go to person. And by no means do I have all the answers at all. But chaplaincy for me is about being there. The mission is all about being immersed in the community and life of the school. I love this quote. Chaplains have been described as pastoral practitioners who seek to build a relationship of trust through compassionate presence and thereby offer help and support to a wide range of people. I'm chaplain to the children and their parents, but also to the staff. And I try and engage with their stories before I try and share mine, before I try and do anything else. I try and sit alongside and join in with their stories. So my aims, I would say, are threefold and in this order to meet, love and care for the children where they are. To introduce them to God in relevant and creative ways and to create and develop opportunities for them to explore their own faith journey. Chaplaincy for me is about empowering children. It's about hearing from them. It's about them being seen and being heard. I see myself as a fellow traveller. We sometimes look at the map together, but I'm definitely not a map maker. And I'm certainly sometimes not even a map reader, but we figure stuff out together. And that's often what I say to the to the kids. I think one of my most overused phrases is, I wish I had a magic wand to fix it all for you, but I don't. However, let's let's sit together and let's figure this out and let's talk to God. It's difficult, obviously, in lockdown. I, again, appreciate my position in a new way because I'm part of the school, I'm employed by the school, I'm part of the staff. I've continued to be able to, to go in for most of the time and support our vulnerable and key worker children. However, we have done a lot of stuff online. We have had to think outside the box. And um, one of the projects that we, we did during lockdown was if you could ask God anything. I've got a little boy, he's in year six now, uh, Jack, and he absolutely loves asking questions. Like, so um, one of my duties is the gate, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and every week without fail he'll come with at least one question in the week mrs simpson why did god do this mrs simpson did god do the other nine times out of ten they're like completely random unanswerable bizarre questions but that kind of led me to to an idea for a project so in lockdown we we made little films and the kids could say right if we can ask god anything what would it be and they posed their questions and then i got um people in the community including bishop paul uh to to answer those questions and it was just a fun way but they love kind of seeing themselves and they love having their their questions answered i think the most important aspect of chaplaincy for me is creating a safe place. Now I do have, some would say it's a cupboard, but I'm telling you it's an office uh, in school and it's full of cuddly toys and it's full of lovely things and the children can come and it's a place of safety. But we don't necessarily have to have a physical place. What's important is that we foster uh, a place of safety in that relationship that we have. And that's when the privilege really comes, when stories are shared, where truths are told, where hearts are opened up. And it's the most amazing job in the world. It's a privilege, it, it's hard, it's sad, it, tears me apart sometimes but it's an absolute honour. So when I have kids like Lucy who 
come and talk to me because mum and dad have split up and she doesn't really know where she's at and she feels quite rejected and she's lonely and confused and she's made some really good friends online and one of them wants to meet her he says he's in Manchester and he's 13 <sighs> oh there's Olivia and Michael mum and dad separated a while ago and it's it's really hard because they still argue all the time and Michael feels protective of his little sister and he tells me he's sick of being in the middle and he just comes and he has a few tears. There's so many stories I could tell you. There's Nevin. My dad hurts my mum and I'm scared and I don't know what to do and I don't know what to say when I have to talk to my dad. Why am I in care? Why did Grandad have to die? Is my dog in heaven? Why did my dad kill himself? We go from the big stuff to the little stuff to the big stuff to the little stuff. But it's about being there. It's about being there in the ups and the downs. I still can't sit through a Christmas performance of the children without crying. And it's like ridiculous now because I've had like years and years of of practice to like get out and it just gets me every time there's just something so amazing about hearing all the little voices singing and like it all going wrong and it's just great but it's been there in the hard times as well it's the privilege of of leading memorial services for children that we've lost i'm telling you my story um my encouragement to you is find your own story in your own schools. Build a meaningful relationship of service. Find ways to become part of their story. There's a bit of a, a marketing strategy that says notice what people already do and work out ways that you can either disrupt or become part of those rituals. What does a school need now? Like we, we can assume, we can guess, we can surmise, but talk to your school. What help can you give? What do they need? I know in my school at the minute, if somebody would say, oh, um, you know, I can give you a couple of hours a week. What can I do? We'd say, please come and do playground duty because we're so short staffed that our staff can't get a break. Obviously, there's there's rules and regulations around social distancing and whether you can do that and be outside and all the rest of it. But there are things that you can offer to do that perhaps you wouldn't normally think of. The best duty um, and the most successful duty that I've ever done in school is gate duty. Now, I get about two nice days in the year and it's freezing the rest of the time. But that duty gives me the opportunity to welcome the children in every day, to see the parents, to strike up conversations, to find out what's going on, to just be a part of the community of the school gate maybe this isn't something that you've ever thought of doing before um but in time perhaps that's something that you could offer can i just be around and and make sure the kids are getting into school safely you get to know them you get to know the staff if the staff are going to get a, a better break you score points there trust me I could, again, go on and on and on with stories and examples of, of, of things that, that I've done in the last few years in school. It's the relationships. That's the thing that makes chaplaincy special. It's the relationships. I've done collective worships that have been a complete disaster. I've done some that have been really good fun and seem to have gone down well. I've done prayer space days that have been amazing, that have been led by children. Um, we've done charity events, we've done all kinds of things, but the thing that makes chaplaincy special is relationship. So I would encourage you to be a part of the story in your primary school that you have in mind right now. It could be that you think, right, well, OK, we're limited at the minute. We can't go in. But could we offer to do something for anti-bullying week, for example? Could we make a film? Could we do something for mental health day in October? Think in the language and the calendar and the world of school. Think of their story and how you might be able to join in in a different way. And finally, um, try and be led and learn from the children. 
Matthew 18 says, he called a little child to him and placed the child among him. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like the little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The best ideas come from the kids. They really, really do. And it means getting down and just being with them and maybe he's not being famous and not doing the high profile stuff. It means being with the kids and the kids knowing that you are there to listen to them and to care. Don't underestimate. Remember the prayer at the beginning. Don't underestimate what they already know, how they already connect with God and their ability to want to change the world, their courageous advocacy. Um, again, I haven't got time to tell you loads, loads of stories. Listen to the children. I did a, a pupil voice, a snapshot in time, if you like, when the kids came back to school, the year sixes after lockdown. Sometimes we can assume, we, we assume, we guess, we surmise to actually listen to them, to find out what they want, what bothers them, what they're anxious about. They are craving meaningful, safe relationships like we all are. And chaplaincy is a massive, massive opportunity. Whatever happens in our next chapter of the story of COVID, we do have a message of hope. We have a message that says that nothing can separate us from God's love, that we are made in his image, each and every one of us. And we have an amazing life changing story to share. So let's do that. Let's find new ways to do that and share in other people's stories so that we might share God's story. Catherine, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, lots of information there, lots of your story. But I, I feel like I heard your heart as well. So much of who you are and who you've invested, how you've invested yourself into that school. Brilliant stuff. Um, the questions that briefly appeared at the end of that presentation. Um, we are, Rob and I are going to try, what are we going to do? How do we put those? Catherine, can you remember them? Have you got them in front of you by any chance? Can you unmute yourself and read them to us? Because what we're going to do is take those questions into our breakout groups that Rob is just about to allocate. So could you just read us those two or three questions? Yeah. OK, so thinking about your own context and experience, how might you take the next steps in either launching primary school chaplaincy or developing your work further? How can we best serve you is the key question we need to ask our schools. What might this look like? And how can you hear the voice of the children and young people in your local schools on the things that matter to them? Brilliant. So, yeah, how can we kick off chaplaincy or enhance chaplaincy that's already there? And those key questions, how can we serve you? How can we hear children's uh, voices in schools? Yes, I'm really aware some, some of you participating in this call are not from England. I saw there was quite a few mentions in the chat, um, people from Scotland. So some of the references that Catherine made, particularly to things like SMSC, won't apply to you. Um, my advice to those of you outside of England and Wales, please just have a look at the, the legislation, the, the education legislation that applies to, to your nation, because Often, more often than not, there is, there's some great material in there. There's some way, there's a doorway in, or there's a way of understanding the school system which will help you to articulate chaplaincy or other kinds of ways to serve the school. So please don't be put off by the references to SMSC and SIAMS and things. And thank you for those of you who are posting useful sites for Scotland in the chat right now. Good stuff, thank you. 
Anyway, Rob, we've got some great questions to pose to the live and in the room, Catherine, not the pre-recorded Catherine. We have, yes. And we're going to be um, pretty quick with this. So we'll say about four questions in four minutes type of thing. Um, but we've got a few. So let's, let's get started. Um, so the first one, Catherine, is from Stacy over at YWAM Paisley, uh, who said, uh, what percentage of your time would you say is spent serving teachers and staff directly? Um, I think at the moment, probably half and half, to be honest. Um, I tend to go in on my days in school and try and check in with, with all the staff. I go in early for that purpose so I can kind of just go around and just see how everyone's doing. Again, just maintaining those relationships and checking in so I know what, what's going on in people's lives so I can pray for them. Um, and I'm probably doing that more at the moment than I normally do. Um, but it's actually been a really nice kind of habit to, to sort of get into. Um, so hopefully I will continue that when, when things eventually settle down. Yeah, yeah. And, and then a two part question over from uh, Leslie, which is, um, do you have to be a full, fully fledged vicar to be a school chaplain? No, I am trained for nothing. <laughs> Um, you don't, <laughs> I shouldn't really say that. I? No, you don't have to be ordained. Um, I have done various uh, jobs within churches and youth work and different settings that I think has, have given me very valuable experience in doing what I'm doing now. And I, I do have a theology degree as it happens, but um, you don't need any formal qualifications. Um, like I said, there's lots of things that can give you good experience, just life experience that I think you can bring to the role. Um, places like uh, Chaplaincy Central, Chaplaincy Central for Education is just um, running a course at the moment actually for new chaplains or for people who've been in chaplaincy for less than three years. Um, so there are like training things out there, which um, I would have jumped at a few years ago. So I would definitely encourage you to kind of have a look and that I'll make sure those links uh, are attached at some point. Awesome. Yeah, because the second part of that question was, how do you become a chaplain? <laughs> Make it up. Make it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's lots really. of different routes into it. I think that's what I'm saying is there's no there's no kind of one pathway into chaplaincy, um, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Yep. And then um, we've got a question from um, Ellie Cousins over at the Southampton City Mission um, for you, which is, do you think you can really only have the role in one school? because you need to be so dedicated to that school or community? Or do you think that someone would be able to support multiple schools in a local area? Great question. I think in an ideal world, uh, I would say I want every single school to have their own chaplain, um, because I think that is the best model. I think then you've, you've got a person who is dedicated to that community because all schools are so different and their needs are so different. Um, and I've been very privileged and lucky to, to focus on one school and get to know that school and the governors and the parents and the families. However, realistically, in terms of uh, sort of funding and just manpower, um, I recognise that there are lots and lots of different models of chaplaincy and I think it can work. Um, in more than one school. I think you've got to be uh, quite clear on, on the, the sort of definition of your role. I think you've got to be quite sort of, your time's got to be protected. So you know kind of what you're doing, where and why you're doing it. Um, I'm very unusual in that I'm paid by the school. So I'm actually employed by the school. Um, but again, I know there's the sort of trusts looking at possibly employing across a number of schools or perhaps churches coming together and, and funding one post. And I think there's certainly lots of models to, to look at and work with. There's also quite a few voluntary chaplaincy models as well. I've come across a few where it's not just one person, it's a team. So there's a chaplaincy team sometimes from across a number of churches who offer it collectively. And I think that's a really healthy model as well. Yeah. I think for, for me, the important thing is it's it's about the relationships and that's that's what makes chaplaincy special for me. It's it's about serving those people and making relationships and being there, whether that's half a day a week or full time or whatever it might be, but just being immersed in the community of the school. Yeah. Can I just say um, when you said that quote, tell me the facts and I'll learn. Tell me the truth and I'll believe. Tell me a story and I'll live in my heart forever. It just that just hit me so hard. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. It's it's been such a pleasure to have you with us and to hear your wisdom today. It is 1:30, um, and I'll just say that we did record this, and it will be available for you. Um, we're going to be able to we'll post out some information on when all the seminars are available again. 
Um, so once that's ready, you'll get a you'll get a, a notice for that to be able to watch them back. But thank you all so much for uh, being with us today, and I think it's over back to the live stream pretty soon. Yeah, uh, uh, one forty-five. We will be back on the live stream for the final section of the day. Great to see you all. God bless everyone.